is that in God's style, uh, he has provided for us abundantly in this difficulty. I don't know what this says to us, beloved Easterners, but he's chosen another Westerner to come here and minister to us this morning, uh, indeed from the same state, from California. A man of great stature, I don't even want to read his credentials because it's embarrassing for me to read his credentials, they're so good, they're so impressive. His name is Dr. J. Edwin Thor. Many of you may have read his books. He's authored something in the order of, I believe I'm correct in saying, 35 or books or so. And uh, those books have sold millions of copies. I've got some on my shelves. If you don't have any, you can come and borrow mine. He is Professor Emeritus at Fuller Seminary. He's a scholar. He's a preacher, teacher, a man of God, proven man of God. And uh, we are going to be uh, richly blessed by him. He's also a good friend of Jack Hayford's, having taught in Jack's church uh, for a series that was very powerful and very good. So uh, I think that's rather significant, too. But Dr. Orr, who was here, agreed to come and minister to us. And I think that Jack Hayford wouldn't mind my saying, and I think he would agree, as I said, that we're going to be richly blessed, even beyond perhaps what we would have been blessed had our good brother been here, because we do not know Dr. Orr personally. Most of you don't. And now you're going to know him face to face, and he's going to minister to you. As you know, Jack Hayford was scheduled to uh, uh, speak this afternoon also. Well, again, in God's grand style, uh, he has brought to us a, uh, another man, who is the head of the Assemblies of God in Australia. He's come to us from Australia, and he is in this area and has agreed to come and minister to us this afternoon. He's also a young, a young, a young I cannot say the Korean fellow's name, a young who chose uh, a board. Uh, he knows what's going on all over the world, and particularly in, in the East, uh, the Far East. And he will be here this afternoon at 2 o'clock. His name is David Cartledge, and you're going to be richly blessed by him. But for right now, I want you to turn your attention to God's special gift to us for this morning, Dr. J. Edwin Orr. My grandfather and grandmother were both converted in the great revival of 1859 in Ireland. I remember my grandfather telling us something about it. Such a movement that when the judge went to hold the quarter sessions of the serious cases, the chamberlain went up and said, Your Worship, there are no cases to try. No robberies, no rapes, no murders, no embezzlements, nothing. That was the great revival of 1859. It was my privilege personally to know Evan Roberts, whom God so signally used in the right revival, same sort of thing happened in Wales, 1904-1905. There were emergency meetings of the district councils to discuss what to do with the police now that they were unemployed. In one case, they sent for a sergeant of the police, and a councillor asked him, what do you do with your time? Well, he said before the revival, we had two main jobs. One was to prevent crime, the other was to control crowds at football games, market days, that sort of thing. Since the revival was practically no crime, so we just go to the crowds. The counselor said, What does that mean? Well, the counselor said, You know where the crowds are. Every church is filled. But do they need police? direction to find their own church? Oh, you must understand, we have 17 police in our station. We've got three excellent men quartets. <laughs> if any church wants a quartet, they just notify the police. <laughs> that was happening all over the world. They were even slow downs in the coal mines. 
Not strikes, slowdowns. So many Welsh coal miners were converted and stopped using profanity that the horses that dragged the trucks in the mines couldn't understand what was being said. <laughs> and transportation slowed down. Now I find, especially my Pentecostal friends, have all heard of the Welsh revival, but they don't seem to know that it affected the rest of the world. It swept Norway. The Norwegian Parliament passed special legislation to allow Lutheran laymen to conduct Holy Communion. So many people wanted to take communion, the clergy couldn't keep up with it. The same revival swept Sweden and Denmark and Finland, both out in India, swept China and Japan. People talk about Japan being a resistant culture. The churches in Japan that year grew 62.5% in one year. It was called the springtime of God in Japan. And that revival swept the states. You see, I was watching some of the things on some hundred club. And they jumped from the great revival to Azusa Street. Azusa Street happened at the end of a great revival in the United States. Maybe a million people converted. Uh, about 120 in Azusa Street had a new experience, and that about developed a Pentecostal explosion. But do you know that 200 major stores in Portland, Oregon, closed each day from 11 to 2 for prayer? Do you know that the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Paducah in Kentucky took in a thousand new members in two months and died of overwork? And the Southern Baptist said, what a glorious way to go. <laughs> Do you know that they took a, a kind of census at Atlantic City and discovered only a hundred people left that hadn't been converted? That happened in the revival of 1905 throughout the United States and Canada. And it was out of that moment that came the Pentecostal explosion. A lot of people don't know these things, so perhaps I should uh, give you some uh, facts and fallacies about the Great Awakenings. Have to do with both facts and fallacies. Now, the last time that the Lord was speaking to his disciples, he said to them, they said to him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had been told that when Messiah came, he would deliver the people of God from the tyranny of their enemies. Naturally, they said, now are you going to deliver us? Notice his response. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father has kept under his own direction. God did not give the disciples a blueprint for the timetable. I'm always going to ask, where do you think we are? I don't keep God's timetable. God is sovereign. Now, do you have a blueprint? Now, I'm the second most senior professor in the School of World Mission to Dr. Donald McGavin. You should have heard of Donald McGavin and Church Growth. But notice, when the Lord left the disciples, he didn't give them a blueprint. He didn't say, now, you must make a study of church growth and then act this way and that way. Oh, no. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I've been living in some of the big churches here in downtown Norfolk. I had a regular meetings in Freemason Street Baptist Church some years ago. And uh, some churches are very well organized. But the Lord did not leave an organized congregation behind. He left just a prayer meeting. Just a prayer meeting. Nothing more. It says that they all continued with one accord. Who are they there? Well, there were the eleven disciples were there, two candidates for Jesus' place, that's thirteen. Mary was there, the mother of Jesus, that's fourteen. The half brothers of Jesus were there, that's eighteen. We know about twenty names, but there were hundred and twenty in the upper room. They continued in prayer. In other words, our Lord left a protracted prayer meeting and not an organization. 
Then when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there came what we call the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I was asked yesterday by Pat Robertson, do you think we're in revival now? I said, well, we're in a revival of interesting revival. That's certainly true. But the word revival is a very controversial word in some respects. I saw a church in the San Fernando Valley who had a sign outside it which said, uh, Revival every Monday. <laughs> Five miles away in Burbank, there's another sign that said, Revival every night except Monday. I was lecturing at Bailey University when a Baptist pastor in Yorker told me, well, the way we had a revival here last fall and we'd be got revived. I said, then we didn't have a revival. Oh, yes, we did. He told me the name of the evangelist and the name of the song leader. And he told me how much money they put out in publicity, but he said, we never got off the ground. I mentioned that when I was speaking to the Southern Baptists at Ridgecrest, the Golden Camp in North Carolina. And one man came up and he said, I'm a deacon in that church. Is that was the worst revival you ever had? <laughs> See, you weren't talking about the same things. By the way, you can blame this on a great man of God. Now, I have to be very careful in saying this because um, some people get quite upset when I say it. You can blame it on Charles Finney. Then he said, Revival, I'm quoting exactly, is nothing more than the right use of the appropriate means. And that's what you call the do it yourself school. Now, Jonathan Edwards, about whom we heard yesterday quite a bit, said, Revival is the work of God. What does Finney mean? Some people say, Well, perhaps you're a little hard on Finney, misinterpreting him. He gives the illustration, just as a farmer chooses a day to plow the field and chooses a day to sow the seed and chooses a day to reap the harvest, so you can have revival. That was a funny position. I think I would say that the scripture takes a different point of view. Much as I've benefited from reading Finney in other respects, for instance, Finney said, The maturing of God exaggerate the work of grace in the midst the Spirit of God is commonly grieved. That's certainly true. But lots of gems like that from Finney. But you couldn't say revival is nothing more than the right use of the appropriate means. So, how are we going to settle this? What are we going to do about it? Well, first of all, the word revival, in the religious sense, appeared in the dictionary in 1702 for the first time. It was defined as an awakening in or of religion, especially after a period of decline. Now, you all understand that definition. You'll find that in every American British dictionary or encyclopedia. But since about 30 years ago, in American dictionaries, there's a second choice. A an awakening in or of religion. Evangelical religion is always understood because the word revival is not a Roman Catholic word or a Greek Orthodox word or a Jewish word or a Muslim word. It's definitely an evangelical word. But since about 30 years ago in the American dictionaries, it says, also be a week of meetings, especially in the South. Now, how do you get from one to the other? Well, it's just this. In times of revival, when the Holy Spirit's outpoured upon the whole body of Christ, you go everywhere holding meetings, you experience revival. So they started calling a week of meetings a revival. I was at Asbury College, one of my favorite stamping grounds. And the old professor said to me, you warm my heart. He said, you know, I've been through three revivals here. I said, tell me, were they organized? 
Oh, he did quite the contrary. He said, last one, 1970, the, the president had left town. I said, maybe he should leave town after. <laughs> <laughs> the president was standing with us at the time, he's a good friend of mine. I tell me what happened. Well, he said, we just had our annual revival and nothing much happened. The students were disappointed and they started having half nights of prayer and then, then we really had revival. But I said, you just said you just had your revival. He said, I see what you mean. I didn't have a chance to see when you come, when you come from California to speak on the 700 Club and get 10 minutes, you can't say everything you want to say. That one of the hindrances to revival in the United States is a misuse of the word revival. People are intrigued about it. I, I remember a song that was coming to me and saying, well, you know, you really shook me up there. I'll never misuse that word again. I said, well, what's your home state? He said, Tennessee. I should have been back there. And they said, you're going to Mobile, Alabama to hold another revival. And there you go again. Now, how can we deal with the subject? When the Apostle Peter stood up at Pentecost, he said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Is the outpouring of the spirit the work of God or the work of man? It's only one answer. The Lord Jesus said, The wind blows where it lists. You can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going to, so it is with the spirit. There is no organization under heaven whether it's World Vision or the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association or the National Association of Evangelicals or the Vatican that can say we have organized an outpouring of the Holy Spirit beginning the 15th of January next year. It cannot be done. I doubt even if it can be predicted unless the Lord puts it into the mouth of one of his prophets. And again, he has to be very sure when he's speaking for the Lord, otherwise he makes it full of himself. Now this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What is the effect of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? First of all, the reviving of the church. And by church, I don't mean the organized body, but the better believers, all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. The first effect of revival is the first effect of the outpouring of the Spirit is the reviving of the church. Now, would you say that's the work of God or the work of man? I'd have to say both. It's the work of God, definitely. But it takes the response of believers. Believers can refuse to be revived. Some do. I've been in meeting the square. The pastor actually stopped what was going on because confession of sin had begun and he was afraid of being exposed. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. So revival is the work of God with the response of believers. Now, I used to hold the view, revive the church and win the world. In fact, that was one of the slogans that Evan Roberts used. Certainly, if you've got a church from fire to God, you're bound to win souls to, to Christ. But is it automatic? The Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and overnight, 120 believers became 3,120. That's what Dr. Donald McGavin calls very satisfactory church growth. <laughs> what was the secret? Well, he preached the word, and he was filled with the Spirit. Does that mean if you preach the word and you're filled with the Spirit, you'll have results like that? Not necessarily so. Stephen was filled with the Spirit. The Scripture says so. And he preached the word just as faithfully as did Peter. But instead of adding 3,000, they subtracted one. They killed him. And I suddenly saw a truth I'd never seen before. When we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the body of believers, we should also pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the masses of people. I used to think that John Wesley was such a genius of an evangelist 
that when he preached, strong men that never darkened the church door wept and found a savior. But if you know anything about John Wesley, at the beginning at least he was a rather stuffy high churchman. He was an Oxford dumb. Very prim and proper. He read about his preaching at Bristol. He said, I made a series of appeals to the conscience and to the will. And the Holy Spirit fell on these people. Was it John Wesley's day? No. The same Holy Spirit was outpoured upon the masses of the people. And that's something you need to pray for. When he has come, he said that, the Lord Jesus, he will convict the world. Have you ever tried to convict them without the Holy Spirit? Stop someone in the streets of Norfolk and try and convict them of sin. He will tell you where to go. And he'll say a few home truths about your denomination into the bargain. No. It takes the Holy Spirit to convict of sin. Yet in times of great revival, people come weeping to God. In evangelism, the evangelist seeks the sinner. But in the days of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the sinners come running to God. So we need to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the masses. Then the Revived Church evangelizes and teaches. The best definition of evangelism that I know was one written by a dear friend of mine who died about four years ago, Canon Max Warren of Westminster Abbey. To evangelize is so to present Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit that men may come to people trust in him as Savior and to serve him as Lord in the fellowship of his church and in the vocations of the common life. I repeat that. To evangelize is so to present Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit that men may come to people trust in him as Savior and to serve him as Lord in the fellowship of his church and the vocations of the common life. Now, is evangelism the work of God or the work of man? It's the work of man. It's God's blessing. Man's expected to organize for it. And if you go start, a week, start, start having an evangelistic campaign and then tell everyone about it, do you expect the results? Well, you may get two or three gathered around you in the open air. But in evangelism, a certain amount of planning, a certain amount of organization, it's necessary. God has committed that to us. That's the duty of the church to evangelize and to teach. There's the great commission. Went to all the world to preach and to teach. And then by many or by few to engage in social action. I'm adding that because it's scriptural. Inasmuch as much you've done done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it done to me. We're told to visit the prisoners and the sick. Look how much has come out of the great awakenings. Most people know very little about the social impact of revival. Out of the second great awakening, the one that began in 1792, came all the, all the Bible societies, British and Foreign Bible Society, the Northern Bible Society, and all the others. Out of it came all the denominational missionary societies. First one was the Baptist Missionary Society, William Carey but then denomination after denomination. Out of it came the abolition of the slave trade. Out of it came, first of all, in the British Empire, the emancipation of the slaves came out of revival. Out of it came popular education. I can mention so many things. Now, there are some people who will confuse social action with evangelism. For instance, I noticed that Southern Baptists, by the way, I'm an ordained Baptist minister, Southern Baptists confuse evangelism with revival. There are some Northern Baptists who confuse social action with evangelism. They say that's evangelism. I remember one of their leaders saying we really must back some of these great evangelists like Castro. Castro. Well, he's had a revolution in Cuba. And they say that's social justice and that's evangelism. I don't follow the logic of that. But uh, that's the relationship. Is there any distinction to be made? Well, I'm going to put it in a very simple way. If 
we do not engage in social action as Christians, somebody else will. But if we do not preach the gospel, nobody else will. So I find a priority there. Now, I've laid out these points because you can't fit anywhere unless you define your terms. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is exclusively the work of God. It's always general. During the great revival of 1858 in Chicago, the Trinity Episcopal Church had 121 members, but two years later built the church for 1,400 members. If the ministers of Chicago had met and someone had said, God has revealed to me that he's going to choose from our midst a world evangelist, I don't think any of them there would have picked a young shoe salesman called D.L. Moody. But the Holy Spirit did. These outpourings of the Holy Spirit are times of recruitment when God chooses a man for a lifetime. These are the movies of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Spirit is the work of God. It cannot be organized, cannot be manipulated. It results in the revival of the church. That's the work of God with the response of believers. But also the outpouring of the Holy Spirit affects the people, makes them willing to listen or hungry for the word. Then the revived church engages in evangelism of holding the blood and in teaching. You evangelize the inquirers, you teach the disciples, those who wish to follow. And by many or by few, you engage in social action. For instance, John Wesley, long before it became popular, wrote a tract called Thoughts on Slavery in which he said it was an abomination to God and men. He was way ahead of his time. Now, Susanna Wesley, his mother, was a very godly woman. If she'd done nothing more than give us John Wesley and Charles Wesley, that would have been a contribution to our humanity. But she never made any statements about slavery. Why? She had 20 children to bring up. 20! She had her hands full. So God hands these jobs out to different people. He may call in one man to go to Congress or Parliament. And that can be a lot of work. So I say by many or by few, we engage in social action. Now, the best way to illustrate this is to illustrate from facts of history. I propose to use the greatest awakening that this country has ever known. But first of all, I have to begin, at the beginning, if you take the past 250 years, more or less, you can see a series of great awakenings. The first was in the days of Wesley and Whitfield, but it didn't begin with them. What we call the first great awakening, or in Britain it's called the Evangelical Revival, began 1727 simultaneously in Hermhut in Germany among the Moravians. That was the first art poem. It began in a prayer meeting that lasted a hundred years. And all the time the Moravians were engaged in prayer like that, they were the leading missionaries in the world. At the same time in the colony of New Jersey, the first sign of revival occurred at a place called New Brunswick, not far from where Princeton is today, in the ministry of a man called Theodore Frelinghausen. The revival was seven years on the way before it broke out in Northampton, Massachusetts, under Jonathan Edwards. Before it affected the Congregationalists in New England, it had begun to affect the Presbyterians in Pennsylvania and the Baptists in the South. At the time of the First Great Awakening, there were only 500 Baptists throughout the colonies. Today in the United States, they claim 21 million. 
The Baptists got the running start in that first great awakening. Because there was a church polity adopted to the frontier. They appointed or ordained farmers to preach and travel with the population moving west, where the Episcopal and Presbyterians and others had to act through Presbytery or through the bishop and so forth. That was the first great awakening. You know that it was in the Holy Club at Oxford. By the way, some student at uh, California Polytechnic asked me the other day when I was introduced to having done my doctorate at Oxford. He said, this Oxford, is it accredited, he said. <laughs> and he was very surprised when I told him no. He said, how come? Well, I said, 1123 when they started, there was no one to accredit them, so they never bothered. <laughs> But in the Holy Club at Oxford, John Wesley read to the group extracts, readings from Jonathan Edwards' book, a narrative of the surprising work of grace at Northampton, Massachusetts. And then there were always links between these things. And then the revival began to spread through the ministry of George Whitfield, who was the first to be awakened over there. But the movement had already begun among the Germans in the Moravian camps in Saxony in Germany. And it was already underway in New Jersey in the ministry of Theodore Frelinghausen. Out of that movement came the Log College just north of Philadelphia, which there is Princeton University. Now that revival lasted about 50 years. The excitement didn't last 50 years. The effects lasted 50 years. Some people seem to think that you only have the revival and you have the excitement. No, no. The definition of the revival in the dictionary is not only bringing new life again, but the state of being revived. Moody was caught up in the revival in Chicago 1858, but he was still preaching 1899. The revival lasted 41 years with him. And we could illustrate that many, many times. That revival, of course, died down and the churches got worldly, not only after the country got divided. When you think of the American Revolutionary War, we mustn't forget that about one-third were revolutionists, about one-third were Tories, a lot of them immigrated to Canada, and about one-third didn't care one way or the other. But when people are so badly divided, they don't... Uh, start prayer meetings about the political convictions. Sometimes they used to burn each other's churches down, and that sort of spurred the ecumenical feeling. <laughs> the Baptists and the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians supported the revolution. Uh, excuse me, not the Methodists. The Episcopalians and the Methodists supported the old country, largely speaking. So the country was divided. 1792 came the next great movement, we call it the Second Great Awakening. It did not begin in the camp meetings of Kentucky and Tennessee. That's very popular with the, with the skeptics and the critics. They like to talk about the extravagances, the barking and the jerking and the dancing up and down and all the rest of it. If they can give a revival a black eye, they'll do it any time. Actually, the revival began in Yorkshire, in 1792, the year after John Wesley died. It began through what was called the Union of Prayer. I won't give you details because you wouldn't be able to follow them all, but uh, it swept Great Britain during the Napoleonic Wars. Then it broke out in Boston. The Baptist minister called Isaac Bacchus wrote to every denomination. At that time, the churches were losing out. Take a typical example, Samuel Shepherd, pastor of the Lenox Congregational Church in Massachusetts, in Lenox, Massachusetts, complained that he hadn't taken anyone into fellowship for 16 years. It was like being chaplain of an old people's home in a funeral parlor. He was just burying them off. Well, he got to the congregation, the largest denomination. Second largest were the Presbyterians. 
In general assembly, they met to deplore the ungodliness of the country. The Methodists were the most aggressively evangelistic in those days, and they were losing more members than they were gaining in spite of immigration. The Baptists said they had the worst winter. The Lutherans discussed uniting with the Episcopalians to prop each other up. Samuel Provost, Episcopal Bishop of New York, quit functioning. He had confirmed Nolan for so long he decided he was out of work, so he took up all of employment. The Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, wrote to the Bishop of Virginia and said, The church is too far gone ever to be redeemed. Voltaire said, Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years' time. And Tom Paine was really echoing that. They took a poll at Harvard, and the whole student body didn't find one believer. They took a poll at Princeton, found only two believers in the whole student body, and only five that didn't belong to the 50 speech movement of that day. Conditions were desperate. Now, you know, in the United States, we had a rough time in the 1960s. But nobody suggested that churches were about to close. But it looked as if Christianity was about to be wiped out. Isaac Bacchus, taking a cue from, a cue from the British, called for one day a month of prayer. They called it the concert of prayer. And that's what brought the nation back to God. The revival began on the East Coast, in the Connecticut Valley, actually. Some people teach that revival is a frontier phenomenon. You find this in many of the history books. This doesn't make any sense. Even in Whitfield's day, when Whitfield came across the Atlantic, he didn't start on the frontier. He headed for the biggest town, Philadelphia. He missed it. He landed in North Carolina because navigation wasn't very exact in those days. But he went up by horse and visited Philadelphia. And for instance, do you think, for instance, um, if believers in Paducah, Kentucky, wanted Billy Graham for crusade, that would be the first place he would go to? Of course not. These world evangelists head for the centers of population. And even treating evangelism as the test, the idea of frontier revivalism is a lot of nonsense. Now, the revival did not begin in Kentucky or Tennessee. That was the last place it reached. It began in the Connecticut Valley and spread like the East Coast. Three quarters of the population in the United States lived east of the Alleghenies in those days. But Kentucky and Tennessee were a law to themselves. Congress reported that in five years in Kentucky there had only been one court of justice held. They couldn't bring criminals to trial. Peter Cartwright, the Methodist evangelist, said that when his father settled in Kentucky, Logan County was called, I'm just trying to think of the peculiar word that he used, um, well, it'll come to me, you must excuse me, I'm just about five years younger than David Duplessis, <laughs> and sometimes my mind will go blank on a, on a, a name. But um, if, if anyone committed a murder in Massachusetts or robbery in Rhode Island, they, one would get away from police, all they had to do was get to Kentucky. They'd be glad to take on. The decent people formed vigilante regiments to fight the outlaws, fought a pitched battle, and lost. The result was Kentucky and Tennessee were very wicked places. But when the revival reached there, it completely transformed the communities. Now that was the second great awakening, and as I said, out of that came the abolition of the slave trade throughout the British, uh, throughout the world, and the emancipation of the slaves throughout the British Empire, and uh, so many other social reforms. I heard Pierce Beaver, professor at the University of Chicago, say that the missionary thrust in those days lasted as long as the concert of prayer, 50 years. Then there came a decline. Now, my main emphasis today will be on this subject of the greatest awakening this country ever experienced. By the 1850s, the country was in decline again. You might say, why? There were no boom, financially speaking. Railroads were built everywhere. People were making money hand over fist. 
When D.L. Moody, as a young man, moved from Boston to Chicago, being a thrifty New Englander, he saved his money. They paid him 18% interest. Don't get that sort of rate of interest unless it's artificial and obtained. That shows you how to demand the watch for money. Everyone is making money in hand of the fist. And people's hearts were turned away from God. Second, the country was seriously divided over the slavery issue. Not the North against the South. That's too simplistic. You read of Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago being split over the issue. Can a man be a member of this church and hold slaves? Throughout the whole country, the country was much more seriously divided than during the Vietnam War. Third thing was that a very godly farmer called um, William Miller had rediscovered the doctrine of the Second Coming, but made the mistake of fastening it on a date, 1844. And when Christ didn't come, 1844, Lots of people were disillusioned. There was a great deal of ridicule made of Christians. So for various reasons, the churches were emptying again. I discovered in recent research that the Baptists in New York State were losing a thousand members a year in spite of immigration. Now, you'll find two explanations of the Great Revival of 1858. First of all, the secular explanation from Professor William McLaughlin of Brown University. He said it was caused by a bank panic. 1857, there was a bank panic. He said that panic-stricken businessmen in their distress turned to God, and that accounted for this great religious awakening. Even John Zerino knew it wasn't that. It was a man called Jeremiah Lanfear. He started the prayer meeting in New York. Only six people came to it, but it grew and grew and spread all over New York and all over the country, and about a million people were converted, and that's how the revival started. McLaughlin says yes, but he started that pyramid at the time of the bank panic. So you've got circular reasoning there. I discovered both the evangelical explanation and the secular explanation are wrong. Actually, the movement began in Canada, which didn't have a bank panic. It began in Hamilton, Ontario. A phenomenal movement of God's Holy Spirit. It was utterly unplanned. A godly Methodist couple, Walter and Phoebe Palmer, used to visit Canada in the summertime to visit the camp meetings. They were on their way back, hoping to get to Albany, New York, before the snow came. They were stuck in Hamilton because their baggage had gone astray. Nowadays, when baggage goes astray, it ends up in Hawaii or somewhere like that. But they decided not to cross the American frontier without the baggage, which was a good idea. So they waited for three days. The ministers of Hamilton said, now we've got you here, let's have special meetings. It was the middle of the week, no time to announce. Only 86 people came to the first meeting. But that night, Phoebe Palmer had a conviction from God that the Holy Spirit was going to move in an extraordinary way. And the following night, the revival movement began. It was largely led by the lay people. Actually, the palm was only preached once. The second thing I discovered that's not new, I've never seen it in print, and I'm hoping to publish it this year. The first community to arrive in the United States were the black slaves of Virginia and the Carolinas. Now, in those days, the black Christians met in the same churches with the white. They occupied a gallery or sat to one side but they met in the same buildings with their masters. So many of them wanted to pray. God's Holy Spirit was moving upon them that they took over the warehouses of Richmond and the other towns in Virginia and the Carolinas, packed them out. You don't read about this in American history. I discovered it in Canadian papers. They spoke of the slave revivals. Who ever heard of the slave revivals of 1857? You say, well, how did it happen? In South Carolina, there was a very godly Presbyterian theologian called John Gerardo. I was over in Alexandria, Virginia, and the theological seminary there, the Episcopal one, they told me that John Gerardo was one of the leading Presbyterian theologians of the South. He could have had any church, any white church he wanted, 
in South Carolina. He was a great preacher as well as a great theologian. But he loved black people. He started what was called a mission church, meant for black people. They had 48 black members and 12 white members. No doubt the white members were the office bearers. But it was meant for black people. He started a prayer meeting for revival. And he said, we won't have any preaching until we feel the power of the Holy Spirit present. The church got full. The elders said, well, why don't you preach, Pastor? He said, we'll wait for the Holy Spirit. One evening while he was sitting in the pulpit while some black brother was praying, he felt as if he was hit by an electric boat. He trembled to his toes. He got up and then he sat down again. When he got up again, there was nothing to account for this in the Presbyterian order of service. <laughs> so he was quite confused. Finally he got up and he said, I believe the Spirit has come. We will start preaching tomorrow evening. Like a good Presbyterian who wanted to prepare for it. He passed the benediction, but nobody moved. Then he said, like a gentle rain, people began sobbing and crying all over the church. Then he began exhorting in the name of the Lord. He didn't wait to prepare. That was the beginning of the revival. White people came in to see what was happening in this black church. Some came to scoff, but remained to pray. The revival spread all over South Carolina. I was telling Ben Kinchlow yesterday, but in 1857, there was an underground army of blacks called the Knights of Tabor. Afterwards, they called themselves the Knights of Liberation. 100,000 drilled men that were army for an insurrection. Well, you've all heard of John Brown. Why did John Brown rob the United States Army at Harper's Ferry? To get guns for the blacks. And of course, the South was very alarmed about this. They had planned an insurrection to march on Atlanta in 1857 in the fall. I got this from Moses Dixon, who became a bishop in the African Episcopal Methodist Church. African Methodist Episcopal Church, I should have said. But uh, during the revival, in which about 100,000 black people were converted, the chief, whose name was not mentioned, had a revelation from God that he was not to do anything. It is if God said, slavery is a sin for which there will be a blood atonement. 600,000 young Americans died in the Civil War. There was a blood atonement. But it is as if the Lord said, it's not your fault. I mean, neither the slave owners in the South nor the abolitionists in the North could say it was the fault of the blacks that they were slaves. So stand aside and God will deliver you. And that's actually what happened. It was utterly amazing that Confederate soldiers marched off to fight the Yankees and left their women and children in the care of the black servants. I've come across a lot of very interesting stories from this. One plantation owner, the wife, I should say, of the owner, called together all her slaves and she said, we've got to have some prayer because the Yankees are getting closer. We don't know what will happen to the plantation. The master's gone fighting with General Lee. So they all got together to pray. And they went with praying, Lord, spare this plantation, and so forth. And as soon as the mistress left, about 11 o'clock at night to go back home, then they said, Lord, bless the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> they had sort of divided well to that. Do you know, if it hadn't been for that revival before the Civil War, perhaps what happened among the blacks in Brazil or in Haiti, Google, Canterbury, would have happened. Instead of that, once the blacks were liberated, Christianity took off like a rocket among them. Now this was the first community to be revived in the United States. Not Jeremiah Lanford's prayer meeting in New York, but the movement among the blacks. Then I discovered to my amazement that revival began breaking out all over the state. In Waco, Texas, all businesses closed, all schools closed, churches full, revival in Iowa, revival in Maine, all over the states, in churches. And then in February of 1858 came the third phase of the revival, what we call the businessman's revival. 
Jeremiah Lanfield had a prayer meeting going from September. It started with six people, but he had a full church by February. And uh, Horace Greeley, you've heard of Horace Greeley, the man who said, Go West, young man. He sent a reporter around the prayer meetings in New York to find how many businessmen were praying at noon. In one hour, he could only visit 12, but he counted 6,110. He must just have rushed from one to the other, whipped up his pony and got off to the next one and counted the many were there, made his report, caused a landslide. 6,110. Then they began really to pray. They took over not only every church in downtown New York, but every theater. For instance, the great uh, Burton's Theater in Chambers Street, packed from pit to roof with 5,000 people. You say, what kind of people? There were 50 ministers of different denominations, about 200 women, and uh, the rest, the 4,750 men. A feminist got after me the other day and said, why were there only 250 women? Well, the women weren't in business in those days. Some of them worked in factories, but they certainly, there were no women secretaries, no, no typists, nothing like that in those days. These 200 women had come down specially for the meeting. It was packed out in New York. Every church packed, every night. You say, every church? Oh, yes. The Roman Catholics got excited. They went to their own churches, and the priests put on special preaching missions with Redemptorist Fathers and Passionist Fathers and St. Paulist, Paulist Fathers and so forth. Even the Unitarians had special meetings. Although Theodore Parker, the leading light among the Unitarians, that they said to expect revival among Unitarians is like expecting sparks when you rub ice blocks together. <laughs> I didn't say that, but he said that. But it did some good. The professor of religion at Harvard, which was a Unitarian institution at that time, started prayer meetings on Wednesdays for undergraduates as a result of which he himself was converted and became an Episcopal bishop. This was the revival of 1858. It went up to Hudson, down the Mohawk. The Baptists had so many candidates for bat believers' baptism that they couldn't get them into their churches. They marched them down to the river Ohio, cut a big square hole in the ice, and baptized them in the cold water, or in the Mohawk River, whatever river they were immersed, of course. And when Baptists do that, they really are on fire. When the revival reached Kalamazoo in Michigan, the first businessman's prayer meeting was convened by an Episcopalian. The town hall was packed. He said, I see our rector is here. We'll ask him to lead in prayer. We'll ask the Methodist minister to read the scripture. Then the meeting is open for prayer. But he said, so many people here, I'm afraid you won't get a chance to pray. Would you perhaps save time by writing your request in a slip of paper? Hang it up. I will read it. Someone will pray for you. The first request he read was, a praying woman asks the prayers of this company for the conversion of her husband who is far from God. Immediately, a burly blacksmith stood in his apron and said, I think my wife wrote that note because I'm far from God. Would someone help me? A lawyer got up and said, I think it was my wife who wrote that. I need some counsel. Five husbands converted in the first five minutes. That's what was happening during that revival. The revival swept. For instance, did you know that the mayor of Chattanooga called for Thanksgiving in February instead of November? He said, why wait to November? They said, well, what, will we announce? what are we celebrating? He said, this is the millennium. <laughs> they thought the millennium had begun. It was interesting, so successful as this revival, it, it encouraged what you call post-millennialism, that we're going to win the world first, then Jesus will come. Western Union, or I should say the equivalent of Western Union, they hadn't formed a union of the telegraph companies. The telegraph companies gave free telegrams to converts. Any convert could send a telegram to his pastor or his parents free, after five o'clock in the evening, before eight o'clock in the morning. He said, how could they afford to do that? Well, they, they, they decided to make a list of what kind of message you'd like to send, send. And A would be, Mother, your prayers have been answered. I've given my heart to Christ. That was A. But C was, 
tell our minister that I've given my heart to Christ and so forth. We do that now uh, for congratulatory telegrams, you know, weddings and all that sort of thing, but uh, this is all on the basis of telegraphs. The population of the United States was a million, a thirty million. There were four million active church members, and in one year they increased 25% across the board to five million. Five million. Twenty-five percent increase in 18 months across the board. You say, how long did the revival last? About 40 years. Not the excitement. The excitement didn't last that long, but the effects lasted that long. I used to suppose that because the revival broke out in 1858 and the Civil War broke out in 1861, that the revival must have come to an end. Oh, no. I've been really researching this again. Do you know that 150,000 Confederate soldiers converted in the armies of Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee? A professor at Washington wrote to me and said, how could you explain a religious revival when these people going out to fight each other? I said, don't ask me to explain it. But it happened. Any of you who are patriotic southerners, you know that General Robert E. Lee would get off his horse sometimes and pray with a man in the ditch who was lying under there, pointing him to Christ. Yet they were fighting on the wrong side, as we would say. And who would make a brief for slavery today? But those who have written books about the Confederate revivals among the soldiers said there was no such movement among the Union armies. I decided the list is worth looking into. So I looked into it too. Someone came to, by the way, I was in a meeting where I heard Archbishop Fulton Sheen turn to President Jimmy Carter and say, Mr. President, there was only one President of the United States in all of our history who ever admitted there was anything wrong with the country. And he said, that was President Lincoln. He said, the official American religion is, we are such a good people, God can't help but bless us. But President Lincoln called upon the nation to engage in a day of prayer to confess our national sins. Well, actually, what happened was someone showed President Lincoln a copy of a Southern paper which said, the Yankees are trusting in their superior numbers and industry and armaments, but God is on our side. Lincoln was always a very truthful man, you know, and he said, well, I'll say this, he said, John Lee Webb is praying more than our boys. That's why they called for their prayer. Two months later, get his work. You know, the Confederates were running rings around the Union troops for two years. Defeat after defeat, Lincoln had to replace general after general. But it wasn't until Gettysburg the tide turned, and that was just after the day of prayer, about two months after the day of prayer. At the same time, he put forth the emancipation of the slaves as a proclamation. However, was there a revival in the, among the Union troops? I came across a report from, do any of you know where Ringo, Georgia is? Well, in Ringo, Georgia, there were 10,000 troops, northern troops, placed for the march through Georgia. Sherman's army. I saw a request from four young evangelists from Illinois to visit the front. And General Sherman wrote by endorsement on the application, certainly not. We have no need of gunpowder and oats the moral teaching. Sherman was quite a rough, he was a general pattern of his day. But he changed his mind and left them in. In Ringwood, Georgia, there's such a revival that one Sunday evening, one Sunday afternoon, we marched 150 soldiers down to the river to be baptized according to preference. Some by immersion, some by pouring, some by sprinkling. They had a communion service of 400 new converts. And that night, Major General Earl Howard, who was killed in the Battle of Tennessee Mountain a month later, preached the gospel and 86 more soldiers were converted. That was a revival among Sherman's troops. One Southerner told me, just spoiled it by mentioning Sherman. <laughs> Sherman's name is not very popular in the South. 
Even when I'm a band of Atlanta. But I also find a revival in Northern Virginia. When the Union troops were attacking Fredericksburg and were driven back in a storm of hail and sleet, and in the bitterness of defeat, every hillside was a prayer meeting. I found to my amazement that the revival of 1857-58 continued in the armies and then broke out again. I found to my amazement in the Presbyterian records that in 1868, ten years after the revival, it said revival reported from 75 Presbyterians out of 92 in some ways greater than 1858. That surely must have been the greatest revival of our time. Well, there's so much one could say about this. By the way, Dr. McLaughlin, who said, well, caused by a bank panic, isn't going to be too pleased when I publish this book showing it was due to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I enjoyed the bunking with the bunkers. That set the pace for the next 40 years. But I'll tell you something else interesting. I remember, I was very close to Billy Graham at the time he had a moving from God at Forest Home, 1939. And when God poured out his spirit upon that great crusade in Los Angeles, I said to Billy, Billy, if you're going to model yourself on any previous evangelist, model yourself on D.L. Moody, well, actually, I said, why well, wouldn't Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was somewhat sensational, you know. He used to build up furniture on the platform to emphasize a point that the one of the man said, he would pick up a chair and smash it on the platform. It, it, great effect, of course. But um, Billy Sunday wasn't quite of the same order as the old lady who became a world evangelist. So I urged Billy Graham to model yourself if you wouldn't model on D.L. Moody. And that's why he became a cooperative evangelist. Moody was willing to work with anyone who would accept his preaching. I think you could say the same to Billy Graham. But um, Moody preached for 31 years after that. But I discovered that no more people converted in the 1858 revival than all of Moody's ministry for the next 40 years. That's something worth thinking about. What God does it's almost as if God says sometimes, stand aside and I'll show you what I can do. The scripture speaks of the days of the right hand of the Almighty. And that's what we are praying for. Not organized crusades. God bless the evangelists. They're the harvesters. But a movement the Holy Spirit will prepare the church for us. That same movement broke out in Northern Ireland. That's where my grandparents were converted. It swept Scotland, 300,000 converts out of the 3 million population. It broke out in England. Out of it came the Salvation Army and the China Indian Mission. Out of it came so many social reforms. This country was engaged in the Civil War, and there isn't much chance to do any reforming during that, except, of course, the abolition of, I should say, the emancipation of the slaves. That was a great step forward. But then all these social reforms came over from Britain after that continued until the end of the century. Then came the great revival of 1905. Worldwide. Touched every place of an evangelical cause. I've written all these things up. Pat Robertson said when he introduced me that I'd written 35 books on revival. I didn't want to correct them right away. But then but I've written more than 35 books, but at least 10 of them are documented works dealing with the great revivals. What about today? Yes, I was in Nagaland not so long ago. The Secretary of the Church Council there is one of my students from Fuller. You all know where Nagaland is. It's just due north from Mizoram. <laughs> it's northwest of Burma, northeast of Bangladesh, and uh, it's a sub gardening Indian state. In 1972, they celebrated their centenary. The Nagas were headhunters when the missions got among them. After a hundred years, they had a hundred thousand converts. A hundred years, a hundred thousand converts. They decided to celebrate, so they wanted Billy Graham to come and hold a crusade. 
the only man who wouldn't let him in. They said, too sensitive an area towards the China border. But Mrs. Gandhi said in New Delhi, I will not give India a bad image by refusing a permit to a man so highly regarded with her brain. I will instruct the Indian army to give him a permit. So they gave him a permit for two days. Delhi had a huge rally, but no campaign. It's a bit like the man who said to the meeting, I lost my notes, so I'm not very well prepared, so I'll have to depend upon the Lord. <laughs> but tomorrow I'll be better prepared, he said. <laughs> no, they now just had to depend upon the Lord, so they devoted all of 1973 to prayer meetings for the Bible. Every church, every week. 1974, consular training in anticipation. 1975, to Outreach, studying the peoples all around them that were still heathen. 1976 came the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at a little village called Wanakin. I'm a little out of touch with Nagel, and I haven't had a letter from him for a couple of years, but after seven years, 100,000 had become 217,000. That's out of a population of 600,000. That means that they're about 90% Christian. You see, they're mostly Baptists and they don't count unbaptized members of families. But when you count all the families in, it's about 90% Christian today. It has charismatic, I was going to say overtones or undertones, whatever you like to say. But uh, everyone, so to say, is brotherly with everybody else. In time when the Bible is almost a honeymoon as far as relationship with Christians are concerned. Same sort of thing going on in Papua New Guinea. Same thing going on in Simon Islands. I've seen the Bible in Brazil. Remember seeing streets packed from wall to wall, the buses couldn't run, people sitting on the tops of the buses listening to the messages. We're not seeing that in the States yet. Notice I said, yet. But we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will be outpoured upon the whole body of Christ. Now, I'd meant to give perhaps a doctrinal message as well, but um, time is limited. I have to go back to an appointment in Los Angeles this evening. And uh, if I may, I could take 15 minutes of questions, providing they're on the subject. And I am sometimes even nervous about taking questions. Somebody says, Is Kissinger the Antichrist? <laughs> Last time I was asked that, I said, Certainly not. Well, why not? I said, so, Antichrist will have no regard for women. You can say, Kissinger. <laughs> well, any question on the subject? Uh, do any of you know the name of David Bryant? He's within the varsity and he's one of the main springs behind this uh, concert of prayer. He came to, I, I've, I've directed a conference of scholars at Oxford for about 10 years. Uh, the sponsor of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Donald Cogan, a very evangelical man. And uh, David Bryant came there and uh, sort of caught the spark there. He studied the great revivals and he said the king is prayer. So he came back and started these concerts of prayer. But not only David Bryant, there's a movement on. Dick Halverson, the chap in the United States Senate, says there's a revival of Anderson revival. On the other hand, the Wall Street Journal said, if we're in the midst of a great evangelical awakening, it's the first one on, history, on record that hasn't affected the morals of the people yet. That's certainly true, too. But... Bill Halvis is also the man who said, um, a lot of people are pleading 2 Corinthians 7.14, if my people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. But they don't finish the verse. Turn from their wicked ways. There has to be a repentance, not only of the masses, but a repentance of the church. The word repent occurs seven times in the letters of the churches. And the word repent doesn't mean to feel sorry, it means to change the attitude. Yes, sir. 
Well, uh, I just wrote to Nancy DeMoss the other day. Uh, are you friends with uh, America Lives Again or something like that? Yes, it's a beautifully illustrated thing. I find that popular writers often uh, mix up a few points, you know. Uh, <laughs> I once heard a very famous soloist, better not mention his name, who said on TV, I'm going to sing a song for you that was written by Charles Wesley for the coronation of Queen Victoria. He said the Queen invited him to a coronation to sing, but he wrote, Your Majesty, not only will I sing, but I'll write a song for the occasion. So this good man sang all four thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise. Only well, problem is Charles Wesley died fifty years before. And I find people get mixed up in some of their facts. I wrote to Nancy about some minor points, but the book is quite I congratulated on the production of this. But Nancy Nancy DeMoss the young lady who was back of that, she came to our conference at Oxford also. Any other question? Yes. Just something came to my mind. I used to wonder, why is it that now John Mackay, who was president of Princeton and the vice president of the World Council of Churches, used to say, we can't learn Latin America with the five points of Calvinism. And he wasn't at all surprised the Pentecostals were running away with the job. There's one reason for it. People in Latin America are conditioned to believe in the supernatural. When Harry Strack and the great Scottish evangelist went to Quito in Ecuador, he was advised, don't come here now. Our Catholic friends are having a 25th anniversary of the winking virgin. A statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary was noticed 25 years before it to wink. And they were having a great celebration of this. Well, as far as people in Latin America are concerned, you have no problem about believing in miracles. So when people did have the religious gifts of the Spirit and came along and demonstrated them, you would understand the response. So uh, I would say that, you know, for instance, the Samuels of God in Brazil, about maybe 4 million members today, when he started in 1912. Yes, the charismatic renewal, I believe, is part of God's plan for this century. I said before, the Pentecostal movement didn't arise in a vacuum. It came out of the great revival, the time of the Welsh revival. Now, the Welsh revival was not glossolalic. A certain famous Pentecostal scholar, and I talked about this in the film, he said, well, I was told that speaking in tongues came to the Zeusa Street from Wales. I said, I've read every report I can find in the translations of Welsh. I can't find speaking in tongues in the Welsh Revival proper. But I know that Evan Roberts did write to Azusa Street. They exchanged correspondence. Then he said, when did speaking in tongues begin in Wales? Now, you want to know exactly? He said, yes. I said, it was in the home of Thomas Maddox Jeffries in a town called Lanfleur in the Ebbe Vale in South Wales on the 23rd of December, 1907, about 8.30 in the evening. <laughs> I said, as a scholar, I wouldn't commit myself further than that. <laughs> he said, who told you that? I said, Donald G. Donald G. was known Mr. Pentecost before David did because he got that title. Donald G. was a segment of the Pentecostal Royal Alliance. Now, the speaking in tongues spread from... He said, well, how did the beginning was? Well, I said, it was through a list of a Pentecostal missionary called A. H. Post who went to Egypt as a missionary. He went with some of the Crouch family, you know, Paul Crouch and so forth. Uh, I know some of the Crouch family, one that was in the Bible school and Bible college in uh, Springfield. But um, the Welsh revival, the general revival, was not glossolalic, nor did it stress healing in particular. No doubt the incidents of healing. But it was all sorts of phenomena, like hearing heavenly choirs sing, things that the British Psychical Association examined. Remarkable movement. But out of that came, I should say rather, that the Pentecostal movement 
spread on the heels of that revival. People were praying for something greater. And on Azusa Street, they began to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit with signs following. That was our emphasis. And the Pentecostal movement really got underway. Now, there were Pentecostal manifestations before that, of course. Even back to 1830 in the Light movement. But um, the Pentecostal movement was uh, a particular development of a general revival. Just as the Baptists came out of the Puritan movement. You know, some, some Southern Baptists here won't agree with me. They think they started in the banks of the Jordan on the John the Baptist. But no, <laughs> the Baptist movement came out of the Puritan movement. The Puritan movement was a general movement affecting all sorts of people. The Baptists emphasized believers' baptism and other things that Baptists are strong about. So you get my idea. The Pentecostal movement arose out of a general revival 1905, all around the world, and uh, used a lot of the same personnel. And then the charismatic movement, of course, has been a more recent development. I've known David Duplessis long before he became famous. He used to just drop in to talk to us in Afrikaans because he was a bit homesick, and he knew that I knew South Africa quite well. But uh, the charismatic movement is a particularized revival with emphasis on the work the personal work of the Holy Spirit. But it has not yet caused the conviction of sin that we need to turn this nation around. We need a general movement, a classic movement. Well, this issue of uh, this issue of church growth and revival, I have a little book that I wrote some time ago, The Outpouring of the Spirit and Revival in the Way, and this issue of church growth. It's written academically, and it's really written to share with my colleagues at Fuller the strong in church growth. Uh, I think church growth is a very useful study. It's a technique, but we need dynamic. i illustrate. I was in New Zealand in 1956. Carly Ten Boom was a member of our team at that time. And I met a Presbyterian minister who had no use for mass evangelism in general, and no use for Billy Graham in particular. I said, well, don't you believe in any kind of evangelism? Oh, yes, he said. I, I believe in visitation evangelism. With tongue and cheek, I said, how do you do that? Well, he said, you train the people, you know, to ring doorbells and speak nicely and not to be too obtrusive and so forth. Refer any difficult cases to the pastor or try and get them to come to church at least and so forth. They explained the whole thing. So I said, that sounds good. How are you getting along? You gave an uncomfortable life. I can't get them to do it, he said. Techniques no use without dynamic. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a dynamic. And I've said in faculty, and I've said in uh, the last time I spoke to an assembly of our School of World Mission, sharing the platform of John McGavin, Ralph Winter, and uh, all the other, Peter Wagner was there and all these other people. I said, you know, I, I've always had a, an odd view that the Holy Spirit knows more about church growth than even Dr. Brown McGavin. <laughs> and Dr. McGavin smiled at that. He knew there's no malice in the remark. God raised him up to emphasize a truth. And church growth is a very useful study for technique. But you see, the Jehovah's Witnesses could use church growth techniques too. Yet they deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there should be no clash except that if you want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit will turn this nation around, it won't be by techniques. It will be by a moving of the Holy Spirit upon the whole body of Christ. Well, just one more question. Back then. I can't hear you. The decline of the Moravians I suppose you could say they lost their vision, but one reason why they lost their vision was that uh, all the other denominations took up their vision, and they were nothing special after a while. But when the Moravians started with their missionary program, nobody else had missionaries out like that. But when all, after the Second Great Awakening, Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and Presbyterians and all of them all had missionaries in the field, there was nothing so special about the Moravian emphasis. And then, of course, the Moravians were a German group. And uh, sometimes they uh, have a, uh, in a cultural cocoon, if I use that expression. 
I thought they were going to ask, why do revivals decline? Uh, I would say they last as long as the generation revived. But each generation needs a new experience. Could I suggest that we'll sing a hymn in conclusion? 425. I wrote this 50 years ago.